In our quantum mechanics class recently, we've been talking about systems of multiple particles. And in particular, the example we've been looking at, simplest example really in a spin system, is a system of two spin one half particles. The classic example of this is a hydrogen atom, which has a spin one half proton in the middle, in the nucleus, and a spin one half electron orbiting around it. And uh, we're looking just at the spin-spin interaction of those two things. The position space business will come later. But for now, we're looking at the interaction of their spins to focus on how we can deal with systems of multiple particles, with combination of multiple systems in quantum mechanics, in the standard dirac Brockett formalism for quantum mechanics. So to do that, well, we know each one of the two particles can be in two possible spin states in our usual basis of the z component of spin as our basis. We've called those plus z and minus z. And so particle one can be either in the plus z state or the minus z state. Particle two can be either in the plus z or the minus z state. And you can see that we've got those two pieces that are independent. As we've seen in class, the idea is that rather than keeping track of those separately somehow, we just label states based on what are all the possible states of the system. And uh, so state number one is when they're both in the plus c state, particle one and two. State number two is plus c for particle one, minus c for particle two. Three is minus c plus c, and four is minus c minus c. Uh, these are arbitrary labels, really. Uh, I, we've just made the most obvious, uh, obvious direct product of the two state ba states of you know, basis state sets for these two particles. We just put the two together, and we're just writing them next to each other. Uh, if we were feeling really mathematician-like, we would probably put a little direct product symbol in between the two. But there's really no other way that you can interpret a product of two kets, so we're not going to worry about that. If we're feeling efficient, we might just write this as a single ket without the one and two labels, labeled, for example, plus z comma minus z. Again, that's maybe a little too efficient. Uh, it, I'll do that more often than not. But when we're first starting out, we want to see explicitly that there are the two separate particle states, and they're both just there present in our state labels. We'll find eventually that these aren't actually the most natural states to write the combined system in. That There are some other ways of combining these states that are actually slicker and a bit cooler and, and capture their properties better. But for now, this is the natural way of writing it. One of the beauties of quantum mechanics, and linear algebra, I guess, is that it doesn't matter what basis you use. If you're as long as you write down things correctly, uh, you're going to get the physics right regardless. Uh, so if we're talking about a spin-spin interaction, an interaction between the two spin one half particles, here's a Hamiltonian we can write down. This is a Hamiltonian that's proportional to the product of the two spins. The spin vector operator for particle one, dot product with the spin vector operator for particle two. Just a dot product of those two, uh, that means that if the two are pointing the same direction, we'll get a positive value. If they're pointing opposite directions, we'll get a negative value. And uh, I guess if we're in the plus or minus z basis, there's no such thing as anything other than that. So it gives us the idea of how this is going to work. That, this looks very like a very classical concept. The beauty of quantum mechanics is that we can use a lot of our classical understanding and just reinterpret it, uh, reanalyze it in this quantum language. So we've got the dot product of spins, and then out front we just have some normalization factors. Uh, the eight, 2 over h bar squared is really just normalization stuff. The h bar squared in the bottom is trying to cancel out the h bars that will come from those two spins eventually. And a is just a measure of the strength of this interaction. It has units of energy, and it's going to just be a strength of the interaction between the two spins. Now, ultimately, what we would like to find, because it's handy, is a matrix representation in our known basis, because it's what we got. We want a matrix representation of this Hamiltonian. That's our goal. We don't have that. All we have is this definition in terms of the product of spins. And the neat thing is we can actually use this definition and plug through with some of the known tools we have for dealing with spins and spin states. And we can use that to find our matrix representation of the Hamiltonian. So let me set up the pieces we're going to need to put that together. First piece is what is a dot product anyway? Well, x component times x component plus y times y plus z times z, just a product of the spin operators that we've known and loved. And notice I've written them as spin 1 and spin 2, 1 and 2, 1 and 2. We're keeping separate, separate operators for the two separate particles. Now, this is an essential thing. I haven't written it down explicitly here because we've already talked about it in class. But remember that operators acting on state 1 and operators acting on state 2, in this case, commute with each other. In other words, they're completely independent of each other. Normally, we worry about order of operations for order of multiplication for operators. 
Well, states one and two, particles one and two, are completely independent things. So we don't actually need to worry about the order for those two. I'm always going to do one, two if I can help it just for convenience, but we can slide them through each other all we need. So that's going to come up in a second. For now, though, even this is kind of messy because I don't normally like, I, I, I don't have a good sense of how to use the operator form of x's and y's in this z basis. I, I, I know they work, but it's not a natural thing to do in this basis. Here's this neat trick. If you're clever, pull in the factor of 2, muck around with definitions. S1 plus S2 minus plus S1 minus S2 plus, and then the product of the two z's again. These are our raising and lowering operators from our single particle spin stuff. Uh, S1, the raising operator for spin 1 times the lowering operator for spin 2, and so on and so forth. You can check. I'll let you check based on the usual definitions of, of the plus and minus raising and lowering operators in terms of spin x and spin y, you can check that this sum, that th this whole term, comes out to be the same. This is just a rearrangement, a reorganization of the same terms, the same physics. So there's nothing special that's gone on here. The reason we want to do this is that the plus and minus operators and the z, spin, s z operators all have really easy, straightforward actions on our plus or minus z states, individual states for the spins. So uh, I can re review those down here. Remember that the sz operator acting on those plus and minus z are the eigenstates of spins of the z component of spin. So it's just oh hey I left out a plus or minus plus or minus h bar over two times plus or minus z. This is just the setting of the basics. We know that the raising operator applied to minus z gives us h bar times plus z. It changes minus z into plus z. We know the lowering operator applied to plus z gives us h bar times minus z. It just lowers it down. And of course, trying to raise the plus z state gives you zero. Trying to lower the minus z state gives you zero. That's all based on our derivation of the raising and lowering operators when we first talked about that ages ago. This is just a review of how these things work. Now remember, in, a, in application, when we actually apply it here, we're going to have separately S1 plus and S2 plus. Those are independent operators that happen to follow the same rules. It's just they only apply to either state 1 or state 2, respectively. That's how it's going to work out. OK, so our goal, our goal is that we want the matrix representation of the Hamiltonian. We want this as a ma in matrix form. And that means we're going to have to evaluate a whole bunch of brackets. State 1, H hat, uh, bra 1, H hat, ket 1, bra 1, H hat, ket 2 bra2, h hat, ket3, all the different combinations. For this video, I just want to practice one set of those things. I'm going to look at, I want to figure out what are the brackets I'm going to find, what are these values that I find. If I sandwich h hat in between, well, I'll try all the different bras, 1, 2, 3, and 4, n. And I'm always going to apply it to ket3, to state 3, because, well, it's only one video, right? We're just doing a piece of all this. So that's what I want to figure out. I want to evaluate those pieces. To do it, there are slick ways of taking some shortcuts here. There are, but I'm not going to do that. I, I want to be sort of, I want to start this out with the most basic idea, just give you the idea, the taste of how you do this, the brute force, just run through it way. And maybe I'll comment at the end on what, the sh what some of the shortcuts are, but honestly, uh, I think the most important thing to know is just how it works in the first place. So how to do that? Well. The, mo the first step we're going to take is just to apply our Hamiltonian operator to ket3, to state 3. We're going to just apply this operator and see what we get. And we know what the definition of state 3 is. It's minus z for particle 1 and plus z for particle 2. And we know what the Hamiltonian is in operators, the plus and minus operators and the z's that act on those states. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to just apply this. We're going to work out what is h hat applied to 3, well, I've got it over here. a over h bar squared times s1 plus s2 minus plus s1 minus s2 plus, don't forget my hats up there because they're operators, plus s1 z s2, whoop, that's not s z z, s2 z, s2 z, all applied to, and I'll put in this state, the minus z for particle 1 and plus z for particle 2. That's the state we're applying this to. And we're just acting on this with our operators. And hey, I mean, it, it's math, right? We just distribute this thing out. We go through. This gives me 
equals a over h bar squared. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to act, uh, act with these operators on this state each time for each, for each one of our three terms. First term, I'm applying my raising operator, S1 plus, and that is going to, so I multiply it out. This guy times the kets at the end. S1 plus acting on minus 1, minus z for particle 1. Remember, it passes right through the S2 minus, but the particle 1 particle 2 things just pass right through each other. They're independent. So that is going to raise this. Um, S1, S plus applied to minus z gives me h bar times plus z for particle 1 times S2 minus applied to that gives me h bar times minus z for particle 2. That's my first term. I've just acted with the raising and lowering on the minus z plus z states over there. That's my first term. I then go on plus S1 minus applied to minus z. Oh, this is already 0 because I'm trying to lower something that's already in the lowest state. No dice there. And finally, uh, these are just eigenstates, S1, z, and S2, z acting on their eigenstates plus Let's see, S1z acting on this gives me minus h bar over 2 times minus z for particle 1 times plus h bar over 2 times plus z for particle 2. This is our usual thing that we want to do with operators. Almost every time, operators are a pain in the neck to work with, and we, go, we want to get rid of those, uh, we want to get rid of the operators and act in ways that we know how it works and we know how it changes our basis. Here we are, we're basically set. Notice, by the way, that each one of these terms has an h bar squared dependence because those are all spin operators. And that's going to cancel our denominator out here, exactly what we want. And so, in the end, this Hamiltonian acting on state 3 gives me a times, what do I have? Plus z1 minus z2 minus 1 fourth, right? Oh, good grief. Ha! Huh, I did that again. Okay, uh, correction in my little thing here. I completely forgot when I pulled my 2 in here, I really should have had plus a factor of 2 times this z term. Always got to check yourself here. Should have had a 2. You could, the z's weren't changed at all between these two, but I did factor in a factor of 2. So there's my 2. Our, there should have been a 2 here, 2 times that. And that means there should have been a 2 here. When you know the answer in advance, you recognize when you get the wrong one. So 2 times a half times a half gives me 1 half times minus z for particle 1 and plus z for particle 2. If you really want to, well, well, we'll stick with we'll stick in this form. If you really wanted to, you could recognize that this product, the plus z minus z for one and two, looks a lot like state two, and minus z plus z. Of course, that was an eigenstate in the first place, and so this is still state three, just with a minus one half prefactor out front. Uh, if I, if you want to recognize these in our basis, and right away that should start to clue you in to what's going to happen. I now have h hat applied to state 3, and it's giving me a mixture of states 2 and 3, but no state 1 and no state 4. That means that what I really want to do is, now this I worked out the Hamiltonian acting on state 3, what I really want to do is now bring in one at a time state 1, 2, 3, and 4 coming in from the side. So when I do that, let's figure out what happens. When I come in and say, what is state 1 bra meeting up with h hat acting on state 3 ket. If I want to write that down, well, okay, right away I can see, since I've already recognized these are states 2 and 3, it's not, going to, it's not going to come out and match any of that. This is going to end up equaling 0. Let me spell it out once, just so we can see exactly how that happens in practice, because it's worth seeing. And it, you'll see the patterns better if you do this. State 1 as a bra is plus z for particle 1 and plus z for particle 2. And then I've got just this factor of a times plus z1 minus z2 minus 1 half minus z1, whoops, minus z1 plus z2. This is where we spelt, we've written this out. I seem to be drifting downward here. Oh, well. Uh, we've written this out. And again, remember, 
the particle one bra and catch stuff and the particle two bra and catch stuff passes right through each other. This A is just a constant factor. It pulls out front. And you'll notice, plus Z1 meets up there. So that those two would meet up and give you their normalized states, normalized basis states. So that gives us a 1. But plus Z for 2 would come and meet up with the ket minus Z2. They're orthogonal. Minus Z and plus Z have different eigenvalues. They're orthogonal states. And so that first term gives me 0. And the second term, plus Z for particle 1, meets up with minus Z for particle 1. That'll also give me a 0 because, again, orthogonal states. So that equals 0. So right away, we can see 1 h hat 3 will give us 0. While I'm at it, since this is the quick and easy one, I'll also point out that state 4 h hat with 3 equals 0. And we'll do this one the easy way. If I take the state 4 bra in here and pull it in, 4 into 2 are orthogonal states, 0. 4 and 3 are orthogonal states, 0. Again, in class, we saw that those were orthogonal, so I'm not going to go through it over and over. But we've got, so we know that 1 and 4 each give us 0. For the others, states 2 and 3, I need to clear some room over here. For states 2 and 3, we can work out exactly how those are going to work, too. Uh, and let's see, when I do that, state 2 h hat 3. We can do this the quick and easy way. We can just say this is 2 bra times a times 2 ket minus 1 half 3 ket. And as we saw in class, again, these are orthonormal states. When, we, when the 2 and the 2 meet up, I get an a. I factor out the constant a, and I just get 2 bra with 2 ket. They're normalized. When the 2 and the 3 meet up, I get 0. So the 2 h hat 3 state, it comes out to be just a. That's my energy factor, that, that scale factor for the Hamiltonian. Similarly, I can figure out that 3 h hat 3 is going to equal 0, because 3 with 2 is 0, minus 1 half a, because 3 with 3 will come out to be 1. And so my 4 things, my four entries then, are 0 for 1 h at 3, a for 2 h at 3, minus 1 half a for 3 h at 3, and 0 for 4 h at 3. If I were going to write this in my big matrix form, if I were trying to write h hat as a matrix in the 1, 2, 3, 4 basis, what I've just worked out, let's see, that will be my 1, Uh, what I've just worked out in this case is, uh, let's see, th this would be 1 h at 1, 2 h at 1, 3 h at 1. So what I've just worked out is this column, 0, a, minus a over 2, 0, I just worked out for this column. Those are the pieces I've worked out. Now, if you want to do this whole matrix, that's its own thing, right? If you want to figure out the whole matrix, you would, in general, need to work out the entire thing, you'd have to work out n h hat 4, n h hat 2, and n h hat 1, all those things. We've seen some of this in class. I'm not going to go through and repeat it all right now. Um, I'll just tell you that in class, we've also seen, for example, that we get an a over 2, 0, 0, 0 for that piece. And in class, we also saw 0 minus a over 2, a, 0. And Actually, at this point, we can already be kind of slick about this. Uh, because the Hamiltonian is a, uh, is a Hermitian matrix, we can always take a conjugate transpose and fill in some other blanks. We know this is going to be 0, 0, and 0. And then if you work it out, we're going to have, there's a symmetry involved here as well, a over 2 in that piece. This is what the full matrix representation of the Hamiltonian will look like once we've done this whole process for multiple pieces, for all the different pieces, we will have h hat turning out to look like this thing. And with that, we've done our calculation. We found the matrix representation we wanted. Enough of that.